So I applied there. I grew up in a small town. I didn't know what this was, but ended up, I, got, I was offered the job on the spot. And my first job out of college was working with 54 adjudicated adolescent boys in a lockdown facility in inner city Portland. Best education I've ever had. I did that for five years. Learned about kids with challenging behaviors. I was really doing well, making in the high four figures, I believe. At the time, I decided that I would go <laughs> after the big money and go into education. So I was alternative certified in special ed with an emphasis in emotional and behavior disorders. And I figured after five years of dealing with the inmates, I'd go work in a pretty little schoolhouse somewhere and have some cute little kids with some mild behavior problems. Well, if you have alt cert and no real experience as a teacher, you have to take who offers you a job. And I ended up working in a lockdown facility. So my first job teaching, I had eight 14 to 18 year old boys in a small little room. And I asked my principal, I don't have any books. And uh, what should we do all day? And what's the curriculum? And he laughed and said, as long as I don't hear from you on a regular basis, you're doing everything I need. The message was, if no one dies, good job. And that's kind of the way teaching was introduced to me. So I did not have any problem with behavior management because I knew how to do that. I'd been doing that every day for the last five years. But what started bothering me was when I said, let's do reading, and they didn't know how, I really didn't know how to teach reading. And it bothered me so much that at one point I just decided I'm not a good teacher. I need to go back to school and learn how to teach. And this was my real interest is what is there about instruction and behavior and how do they go together? So I went back to the University of Oregon and I entered a PhD program in special ed with an emphasis on instructional technology, not computer technology, but What's the science of instruction? My advisor was a guy named George Sugai, who at the time I was a doc student was developing something we called at that time EBS, Effective Behavior Support. A couple years later, we changed the name to PBIS, or Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports. And that's what I've spent most of my career doing, although I think it's grossly misunderstood and hardly ever done correctly, that's a lot of what I end up studying. What I want to talk to you about for an hour, hour and a half tonight is the research I do. I don't really teach anymore. Um, I teach a doc seminar now and again. I'm in schools all the time doing research. So this is kind of fun when I get to go do an actual lecture and talk to actual college students and people that are going to be teachers. I'm going to start with some data from a book we just published last year. I have a little handheld computer thing that we've developed that has all the different things that teachers and students can do in the classroom on it. And I have a bunch of grants with different people working for me, and this is what I do. I send them out to schools, and they sit in classrooms. If you're in a JCPS school or an Oldham County school, you may have had somebody walk in your room, sit in the back, and tap a little thing. That's those people work for me. What they're doing is they're taking data on what do teachers do and what are students doing. I have 13,000 of those observations, and I can tell you what the average teacher does. I can tell you what an elementary teacher does, what a middle school teacher does, and I can tell you what a high school teacher does. And I can tell you what they do during reading, math, science, social studies, all of which is kind of boring. This is what I find interesting. I can tell you what a kid is most likely to do given a teacher does X, Y, or Z. So we can predict kid behavior, and I can predict it in three ways. I can predict active engagement with the lesson or off task, and I can predict disruptive behaviors. So here are three big pieces that came out of this book. Out of the, this is, book was written when we had about 10,000 observations. One, if the school we're watching is Title I, the kids in that school will get less time engaged with teacher and instruction. They're in the classroom the same amount of time, 
but less time will be spent on instruction, and they'll get less positive statements from a teacher and more negative. Two, number probably doesn't surprise you. Kids that have been identified as having behavior problems get less instruction from teachers and more negative interaction from teachers regardless of their behavior. Three, black males control for behavior. You don't really need to control because all of our data says their behaviors don't look any different than anyone else's. But even if you control for behavior, what we'll find is if I go into a school and identify a kid in the classroom as a black male, that kid will get more negative teacher talk regardless of their behavior. Why? Why are these three things true? And we're not the only ones that have seen this. This is pretty much what we see nationally. Here's what I think. There's a grain of truth in all of our brains for these. Whether it's true or not, it doesn't matter. This is implicit bias. Implicit bias is something that every single human has. You're not going to get rid of it. You just have to be aware of it. But this is what it looks like in a classroom. We believe that kids that are from disadvantaged backgrounds are more likely to have problems. That may or may not be true. It actually is true only after we get this ball rolling. But let's just say we believe that's true. This one actually is true. Do kids with behavior problems have more behavior problems? Obviously. So when I see a kid who somebody has said to me, see this kid, he's going to be in your room this year. Keep an eye on him. He's a little behavior problems. All it takes is that one time being said to me, and I will treat that kid differently, even if that kid acts like everybody else. We all believe that minority males are more likely to have problems. In reality, they're not. But people believe that. So here's what we do because we're human beings. I look at a kid and I say, that kid's got one, two, or three of these strikes. And as a teacher who wants to be a good teacher, I want to prevent that kid from having those problems. But we don't really try to prevent. I say this. I'm going to keep an eye on that kid. He's got to do with these strikes. I better keep an eye on him. And this is the way we think. Because if he has a problem, i got to nip that in the bud. you got to nip those problems in the bud. So I have to watch him to make sure that I see it budding. Because if I don't catch it when it's budding, I fail to nip it in the bud. So I'm going to keep my eye on you. <laughs> and this is the way I teach. Now, if you watch somebody and stare and wait for a problem, it's going to happen. Everybody in here does something a little bit wrong, but the kid I'm waiting for, I jump all over. Hey! And I'm over here, and I'm nipping that in the bud. I'm going to show you in a minute why that doesn't work. But let's think about a logic. If you really believe that this kid is more likely to have problems, is waiting for him to have a problem the best way to deal with that? And that's what we do. Wouldn't it be more logical if we said, as you stand at the front of the class, when kids walk in, you should be looking at each one and thinking, where might that kid have a problem today in my class? What could I do right now to make that not happen? Where could I stand? What could I say? How could I teach this a better way to that kid? What kind of relationship? There are all these things that I could do that really minimize the probability of that problem. And if you look at the way teachers as a whole deal with these things, they don't do those things. So I'm going to show you a bunch of things that we know empirically these things make kids more likely to be successful. And I'm also going to show you the data. We don't do them. Why? I don't know. But we don't. We are very good at waiting. Waiting for problems to happen. And then we're really good at waiting to see if they fix themselves without us doing anything, which is also a really bad bet. So if you think about it like that, here's the way I want you to think about all of our problems and solutions. Normal curve. I promise we're not going to talk about statistics. 
But I want you to think about all of your kids as falling in here somewhere, because they do. If you do an assessment of every kid in the world on anything, it's going to fall out like this. These are the kids at the very top, success-wise. These are really high rates of success kids. Two-thirds of your kids are right in the middle average. These are kids that we would say are at risk, meaning these kids, if you're predicting, if you're betting, if you want to go and right now place a bet on where a kid's going to be in the future, these kids have a higher than typical risk of ending up at the bottom. You know what all of our data says happens to kids at this point? Social services in their lifetime, automobile accidents, illicit drug use, child abuse, spousal abuse, jail. Every negative life outcome you can think of is highly, highly probable once you get here. And I'm talking about behavior, but you could build one of these curves for reading or for math or for any other thing kids do. So what we want to do is we want to find interventions that make kids move this way. But here's what I want you to realize. Every single time a kid behaves, whether it's a math behavior or reading behavior or a social behavior, and it's successful, and an adult says, you're right. Statistically, that makes it more likely that kid will be successful again in school. Every success is a statistical predictor for other success. On the other hand, every failure is a statistical predictor for another failure. Just think of the logic. You all work in the same school. I'm coming to your school tomorrow. I want to see a kid who's successful all day long. If the kid I watch is successful all day long, you all get $20,000 tax-free. Can I pick the kid or do you want to pick them? You want to pick. Are you going to pick the kid that has lots of problems or a few problems? He's had 20 good days this year. What's the probability when I'm here tomorrow it'll be day number 21? He's had 50 good days this year. What's the probability that when I'm here tomorrow it'll be day 51? She's had 100 good days this year. What's the more times you've been successful, the higher the probability you'll be successful again. And that's the job of a teacher. Here's my definition of a teacher. Teachers create environments. They really are setting tricks and traps all day for kids to trip and fall on success, and we give them the credit. I go home at night and go, I did that. I taught them. But today I don't go, hey, I just taught you. I go, wow, that was all you. But it really wasn't. It was me. I set that up. But I give all the credit back to the kids. That's what being a teacher is. And the more times they're successful, the more likely it'll continue. So because normal curves are scary and not very interesting, I'll turn this normal curve into a snow hill. We'll play with a snow hill for a while. But it's the same thing. Here's what I want to do. I want to walk into your school and I want to pick the average kid. I'm going to just close my eyes, reach into your roll book, pet a kid, that kid. If you were betting on which kid I was choosing, you should bet that I'm picking the average kid because there are more of them, right? So this snowball represents the average kid in your school. Now, in nature, kids, snowballs, things perched up on little points, don't sit still. Things move. So that snowball is going to be on the other side. What do we know about snowballs when they roll downhill? They get bigger. And if you know Newton's second or third law, what, makes, what happens when they get bigger and heavier? They roll faster. Inertia. Very good. Okay. So if this snowball starts to roll in, it's going to get bigger, heavier, and faster. You know what that means? It's more and more unlikely that it's going to stop, which is great as long as it's rolling that way. So here we are on the first day of school. I am going to do something. So let's say here's my student coming in the door. First day of school. He's really excited to be here. 
And I come in, I meet him at the door. Hey, glad you're here. Did you know that we walked in the hall here to be responsible? Come with me. And he walks and I go, wait a second. Where'd you learn to walk like that? You were probably the best walking kid I've ever seen. I'm glad you're here this year to be such a great example of walking. Now he's walking away going, damn, I didn't know I was a good walker. <laughs> I set him up. But what happened is on the first day of school, I pushed his snowball to the right. Notice it got a little bit bigger. I did that, but I'm giving him the credit for it. Every single time we set kids up to be successful is a statistical probability. Now, is one success a great predictor of the rest of your life? No, but it's a great predictor of two. And two is an even better predictor of three, and you see how this goes. Now, what I want is I want this snowball to get so big, so heavy, and roll so fast that I don't need to be there to help it anymore. I want it to roll right out of this school, and this kid is super successful and confident and independent. You build independence by building success. Confidence comes from being successful. Our job is to create more success. I think that's obvious, and yet I hear this all the time when I'm visiting schools. Put it back up at the top. I'm not going to tell these kids to walk in the hall here. They should know that already. First, you're right, they should. But they don't, so. And a lot of people will say, and we'll go right back to nip it in the bud. Well, I'll be keeping an eye out for people that aren't walking, and we'll beat the run right out of them. How, how well does that work? What data do we have that says you can beat the bad behavior out of kids? None. In fact, it says it'll get worse. So this isn't a logical way to go about it, but we see this all the time. He's coming in. I ain't going to say nothing. I'm just going to wait, and I'll nip it in the bud. He comes in, and he's real excited to be here, so excited. He starts running down the hall, and I say, hey, we walk, not run here. He's watching you this year, runner. First day of school. I caught him, set him straight. But you know what the first day of school was? Failure. A snowball has already started rolling in the wrong direction. It's gathering speed because it's getting heavier. What does all that mean? Think of it as probability. That's what we're talking right now, conditional probabilities. If you were betting on where a kid's gonna be in the future, that's why the further they go down a hill on either side, better the chances will be they stay there. Which is why we should remember this concept, early intervention. That doesn't mean early childhood. It means the first time you see a kid of the year, of the day, of the period, how do you create successes? All of this boils down to something we call behavioral momentum. The more you're doing success or failure, the more likely it is you'll continue to do it. Bet on it. Because more than not, you'll win your bet if you look at it that way. So when I say that to people, we aren't as good at working with kids to make them successful once they've rolled halfway down the hill. How much success to failure do you need to predict you'll keep going in the right direction? There's a lot of debate about that. It depends upon exactly what field you're in, but it varies somewhere between three to one and six to one. But if you have a kid up here that just makes failures and you tell them they made a failure and then they do it right, you got one to one. One to one won't make a snowball go that way. Four to one is a great way to think about it, but here's what we know. Once a snowball has rolled halfway down the hill on this side, which is essentially one standard deviation below the mean, it will take 14 to one to push that snowball back up. Once you find a kid who's already having problems, you aren't going to be able to fix it with the same simple little things you do at the start. So that's why we want to use all those simple little things right at the start. But there'll be some kids that need even more. But the logic of 
let's wait till that kid gets so bad we can't stand it and then try something is idiotic. It is a prescription for failure all the way through. These kids that go all the way down here to the bottom, I, I hate to have to say what I have to say about this, but I'll just tell you the facts. Once you identify a kid in any domain, reading, math, behavior, who's more than two standard deviations below their peers, it's unlikely you'll ever get that snowball back up. That doesn't mean we don't try. That doesn't mean we don't have all this stuff we're going to do. Probability-wise, unlikely. And again, there are those who think what we do is we wait for kids to fail all the way to the bottom, and then we put them in special ed and fix them. Special ed doesn't fix people. It gives them the extra things they need. And if they're that needy, honestly, again, people in my field of emotional behavior disorders, we talk a lot about these kids with the biggest problems is you really treat them like they have diabetes. You aren't going to make them completely like everybody else. How do we teach them the skills they need to survive? I don't want to be in that position. For a very small number of kids, we will be, no matter what we do. But right now, we're doing that with large numbers of kids. And the reason we're doing it with large numbers of kids is because nobody's doing what we need to do right here. And nobody's doing what we need to do here for the kids that get there. We wait and we do things that we know won't work very well. What we want is we want to find things that move our snowballs that way. Here's the way to think about that. Give me a problem from a kid, whether it's reading or math or behavior or writing or you name it, and ask me, what should we do for that kid? And I can give you a list of at least 50 interventions for any kid, all of which are research-based, which is a term I hate. Let's just assume everything is research-based. Let's just assume that because we're confused anyway. Instead of saying, is it research-based, we should say, what's the probability that that would make a difference? And we should take the one of those millions of things that gives us the best probability. This is what I hear people say a lot of times. Well, nothing works for everybody. Exactly. But some things work better than others. So, well, I don't want to use that high probability practice because it doesn't work for everyone. We know brushing teeth doesn't mean you'll never get a cavity, but that's not a reason to say, eh, never brush your teeth. It's still a high probability. We've got high probability interventions for kids. We know what they are. I want to talk to you today about the things that we know move snowballs the furthest. It's a pretty simple set of things, really, when you look at it. Now, here's how we measure that. And I promise no statistics, but I have to give you just a little bit of something here. We can measure how different interventions compare to one another by saying, if you looked at every study that had ever been done on that intervention, to every kid ever studied, and a lot of these, it's hundreds of thousands, you built a normal curve out of all those kids, you can ask this question. How far on that curve would the average kid move by getting that intervention? And you measure that in terms of standard deviations. So if the average kid would move one standard deviation, that would be called an effect size of one. Now, if I know the effect size, I can look at 10 different interventions, and instead of saying, which one's evidence-based? Well, they all are. They're equal. I can say, but if I was betting this kid's life on it, which in many cases you really are, which one gives you the best chance of getting a snowball to roll that way? We have that data. We've had it, actually, for a long time. Here's what we know about the average kid. If you're alive and you have a pulse and you're in a school for a year, you're going to grow about 40% of a standard deviation. We'd say the average kid will have an effect size of 0.4 by being in school for one year. Here's why that's important. If we know a kid's going to grow this much by being there, any new intervention you choose to start using this year that has an effect size of less than that will be completely useless. Hey, 
I picked something that's going to make you grow by less than what you would do if I didn't do it is a waste of your time and their time because it's failure. And a lot of the things we do out there are research-based and have an effect size, but they've got an effect size like this when others have this. Can you think of any reason why when a kid is at risk of having bigger failure and we've got two interventions, one with this big of an effect and one with this big of an effect, why we would choose this one? We do it all the time. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes. What you're saying, they just show up. They just show up. They're going to... Being in school for a year, the average <coughs> kid in the, in the United States from being in school for one year the average would be a growth in any of the areas we look at of about 40% of our standard deviation. Some way more, some way less, but that's average. So I'm just asking because I got kids that actually, like I know everyone else here has kids that do this, and that's why I'm bringing this up. I'm sorry. To no, no, that's good. I got kids that literally just show up. I mean, they show up and they do nothing. For them. They've done nothing for anyone. Saying they might improve by point. I mean, statistically, they might improve by yeah, point. That's the average. That's the average. Okay, so, so there are kids that are showing up, they're actually blowing that average so, up. The, the question I want to answer, I hope, today is if kids aren't doing what we want, what are the things that we have to do to make that happen? And I would never say if it's not happening that it's your fault as a teacher, but I would always say. If it's not working, it's my responsibility to figure out what I have to do next. And you might try a million things and none of them work. That's the responsibility. There's no fault as long as we're doing that responsibility. So I'm just going to try to give you what some of those things are. This book by John Hattie is the one that, I mean, there's a bunch of people doing this, but this is the one people speak to. What John Hattie did real simply, well, I say simply, I couldn't do it is he found every study that you could find on any given intervention, did the meta-analysis, came up with an effect size, and then he just published them all and said, here's what we know. He doesn't say in the book, you should do this. He says, look at your kid, look at the circumstances, look at the context, but these are the probabilities. Here's what I like about, here's what I find interesting about John Hattie's book. I was a, teacher in the 80s and a doctoral student in the early 90s. And this book, the Handbook of Research on Teaching, which back in the day we called the Brophy and Good stuff. Gary Brophy, Tom Good, David Berliner, Barack Rosenstein, the effective school stuff. What these guys did in the 1970s was they went around to schools, went into classrooms, and watched teachers. And they came up with what they called an effective classroom, which, long story short, would be Kids are really engaged, kids are achieving, and there aren't lots of behavior problems. And so what those guys said was, what are the teachers in those classrooms doing differently than teachers in ones that don't look like that? And they came up with this list. Here's what I find interesting. That list of things from the 1970s is exactly the same as John Hattie's big effect sizes. There's really nothing new here. Good instruction has always been good instruction. Having relationships with kids has always been something that works. These things aren't super new, but we don't see people doing them. So I like to think about it like this. Let A be the kids in your classroom. Let C be what you want them to do to be successful. And it's a, an unlimited range of things. I want them to say four when we say two plus two, and I want them to be able to read this passage and tell me why they think so. And I want them to handle a conflict without slipping anybody in the throat. And I want them to, what do you want your kids to do? Here's the question we're asking in education, and it's a stupid question. What kinds of things could I do that might make that happen? And here's the answer, almost anything. But that was the wrong question. The question we should be asking is, what kind of thing could I do to maximize the probability of a kid's success so I could say to them, you did it? Because if I can't do that, we don't raise the probability of them doing it again. And some things have higher probabilities than others. Here's the list of the biggest effect sizes we know of. This list, which I'll describe in my field again, emotional behavior disorders, this list of things has a bigger effect size than medication or psychotherapy. 
That certainly doesn't mean we don't need medication and psychotherapy, we do. What it means is we should never even be considering those things until we made sure these things are there. And I'll read these to you. One, be explicit. Tell kids what it is you want from them and why. And it isn't a shut up, here's what you're doing. So, hey, we talked about this before. At your house, how do you do this? What would be another way to do that? How does that fit in with, this is what we're talking about today. You've got to make this clear where it fits to them. If it doesn't connect with them, which I'll talk about in a, in a second, it ain't going to work. But you've got to make that connection for them. It's incredibly clear that kids that don't have background knowledge coming in don't get any of the things we're doing unless you make it explicit. And then when they don't get it that first day or week, a snowball has started rolling in the wrong direction. Two, modeling and demonstrations. And again, you can do this horribly. Sit down and shut up, I'm gonna show you something. This is important is horrible instruction. Although it includes explicit modeling, it's horrible instruction. Engagement is our big one. Put that one in your pocket. David Berliner, really famous researcher in our field, education at large, has said, if you're an educator, engagement is your foundation. And you should think if you're an educator, you should think of engagement the way physicists think of gravity or Biologists think of homeostasis, or psychologists think of reinforcement, engagement. That's what we're here for with kids. How do you engage them in what you're doing? If kids aren't engaged, it won't work. But you use your engagement to get other things going. Simply being engaged isn't enough. Set goals and work toward goals. You get bigger effects, and that's not just for kids, it's for people. Be consistent. Now, I know that you've got classrooms where you don't have to be consistent at all, and it'd be just fine. But if you don't know, there's a ton of data out there that says the more teachers do things in the same way, in the same order on a daily basis, the fewer problems there will be. Guide practice. I see this too much. All right, that's the lesson. Go do it. What I want is to see that a teacher has said, I've set you up to be successful. I'm going to hold your hand as lightly as possible as we go to the next step. There will be some kids I don't need to hold. But I'm going to lead you into the next layer of success. And gradually, I want your snowball to get so big that you don't need my hand at all. Proximity. I'm going to talk more about this as we go through. This is my least favorite kind of classroom to teach in because it's impossible for me to walk through this room, so I don't. But if I were in a classroom while I'm teaching, and I saw Steve kind of doing that because you can't really do it in this room, but I want to be walking through and talking right to people and not doing everything from the front. It's, this is just a really difficult classroom for that kind of thing. Here's one that's really important that a lot of people don't think about. Repetition, practice, super important. Doing a whole bunch of it right at one time kills kids, kills their spirit, makes them hate it, etc. All the data we have says you want to have small numbers of practice at high rates of success over time. Here's a great reason for project-based kind of things, because every day I go to the project, I'm repeating some of these steps, but it's not rote. It's in the context of something authentic. But when you say, hey, you've learned to do that math problem, well, why don't you go to the book and do the next hundred on your own? <laughs> After two, I hate you and math. I've blown it up by making it aversive. It has to be, practice has to be successful. Formative assessment, and I'll go back to this big one. You've got to have higher rates of success than you do failure, and let's say four to one is a minimum, but a lot of our kids will need more. Now, you get your big effect not by doing one of these things, but by doing all of them. And this is all we've got. This is probably the question I'm asked most often. Like, okay, I get it. All that stuff is fine. 
But what do I do for that really problem? I don't have a special box that I only pull out when you show me the monster kid. The monster box out for the monster kid. This is the stuff. When you show me that kid with the biggest problems, we're going to have to sit down and say, what does that modeling need to look like for that kid? Maybe I shouldn't be the one modeling. Maybe somebody else should. How will we engage that kid? Because if I just go, hey, let's work together, he'll spit on me. What's the way I have to engage? So you're going to have to individualize this stuff, but it's the stuff. We don't have another set of stuff. Nothing gives you a better probability of kids being successful than this set of stuff. I'm going to break this into three pieces so that I'm not talking to you for the entire night. Three things we know offer us a great probability, domains. One is instruction. I'll talk about that a little. Two is environment. We can do a lot with our environment that makes it higher likelihood for kids being successful. And three is relationships. Relationships is the hardest one for me because I don't know how to teach it. And you all, if you've been in education at all, I'm not telling you something you don't know. You can go into a classroom and in two minutes you can know this person shouldn't be working with kids. And I've been a teacher trainer who said, I'd like to come observe you again tomorrow and could you do it with a smile tomorrow? And then you find out, no, they can't. And you think, it seems like if you don't like kids, teaching was a weird choice. But I don't know what to do with that. We know that when there's a positive relationship, learning is accelerated, and so is everything else. Behavior problems go down. So because I don't know what to do with that, this is what I like to think. We do have this evidence. When kids get effective instruction, it makes them more successful. And when they're more successful, they're more confident. And when they're more confident, their snowball starts rolling to the right, which means instruction works even better the next time. Now, hear me on this. This whole thing would have worked even better if we would have started with good relationship. But let's say I don't know how to like kids for some reason. <laughs> what we know is when kids are really successful in a classroom, they'll report that they like their teacher more and they'll report they think their teacher likes them more. So while this isn't a substitute for good relationships, I just think it's important to understand that good instruction builds relationships and relationships help instruction. So again, I'd like to have both but we don't always. So here's some data. This was, this says Impress, this was published late last year. Three things we looked at with teachers because it's what the evidence told us to look for. To what degree is the teacher during instruction watching kids and talking to kids and engaging kids? We call this driving the lesson. They're not going, why don't you guys go learn something? And I'll read some papers. The teacher is in the lesson with the kids, going driving. Second, and that's a time spent. What percentage of time? Second, opportunities to respond. How many times did the teacher give the kids a chance to do or say? Raise your hand if you agree. Turn to your neighbor and tell them how you figured that out. Write that down and hold it up for everyone to see. You and your neighbor build one of those. Every one of those is called an OTR. We want to know how many OTRs are being used. I'll give you a hint. The data that we collected, my colleague Regina Hearn and I collected this several years ago, teachers using three per minute during instruction have higher active engagement and far lower disruption. Engagement is a teacher behavior. Three, we just count how many times the teacher told kids they were doing it right. It could have been like this, wow, that's great, or it could have been, yes, anything that says we acknowledge something you did. So here's what we did. We took these three things and put them together, and we asked out of this big, giant data set, something called latent class analysis, how many different kinds of teacher are there? Turns out the data says there's classes of teacher on these three things, high, medium, low. So now, if you know that, you can predict kid behavior. Here's how well we can do this now. 
If I go into a classroom and watch a teacher teach for 10 minutes and use our little data set, code set, if the teacher I'm watching uses these three things in the lower third of all teachers, right now you can predict kids in that classroom are 27% more likely to not be doing anything you want them to do and 67% more likely to be disruptive. There's nothing we have found in any of the research that predicts kid disruptive behavior better than teacher instructional behavior. Uh, I know the model probably like accounts for it. How do you know? How did you know putting it in that um, it wasn't the the lack of disruptions and the on task behavior that was allowing a teacher to give more opportunities for response or more positive feedback or more time teaching rather than dealing with some sort of behavior we disruption? Know. So it could also be right. sort of like. And I'm sure it's snowballs too. So like once you start giving some positive feedback, you also get the opportunity to give some more. Absolutely. Because you're not having to say like stop cussing. <laughs> yeah. This isn't as inferential as some of the other things I'm going to show you. Uh -huh. This is a probability. Okay. So again, I can't say if you do this, this will happen. What I can say is if I watch this and see this much, here's my prediction, and it's pretty accurate. So what we're trying to do is be able to say, if we know teachers that do this get these outcomes, and teachers that do this are this much more likely to get the good outcome, I'd rather have them do this, because it's a better probability. Not causal, not 100%. We can't say that nothing in education is. That's a great, very smart question. Um, so let's start with instruction real quick. I can't see what I'm coming up with, so let me see. No, I'm just going to see. Oh, okay. This one connects back really well to PBIS. And a lot of times I don't like to say PBIS because I get booed a lot for PBIS. It's not my fault. It's really a simple thing that people just aren't doing right and making it really hard. But anyway, you know how in PBIS, they say, you should have a poster in your front hall that says, we're respectful, responsible, yada, yada, whatever. That's not because posters are cool and cute to have in the hall. That's a bonus that they're cool and cute. Here's why that was there from the very beginning. When we were first laying out what should that look like, the idea was that you teach behavior in the school. And if you're teaching a thousand arbitrary rules to kids, it doesn't work. You need to anchor them. We don't teach every word in the dictionary. We don't teach every math problem. We teach rules and anchor them. So here was the idea. Your long-term memory is where you store all the stuff you need to be successful, right? Your skills. And so you get a flat tire, you go up to your long-term memory, and you go find the flat tire folder, and you find the different kinds of jacks inside that, and you, find, and you can solve your problem because you've got the information up there. Your working memory is like your processor. When you run into a problem, it goes and finds the stuff. What if this is you? The long-term memory is a lot like a hard drive. It just has everything on there. It doesn't do anything. It just stores it. The processor goes and gets it. What if I told you on your computer, you're no longer allowed to use any folders. None. Every document must sit on the desktop. And then I said to you, hey, you know that thing you wrote? I can't remember the title, but it's like three or four years ago. I need that. Go get it. You've got 50,000 documents on your desktop. How long will you start sorting before you go, screw him. I'd rather go sit in the office than find that. Fairly soon. Well, here's the problem. If we give kids rules every day without connecting them, and this is what we do. Oh, by the way, we don't have gum in here. You know what that kid's thinking right now? First of all, that power-hungry jerk just made up a rule to piss me off. First of all, why can't we have gum? There's no reason to do this. He just made it up. And here's what all the evidence says. If you don't give kids something to hang that rule on, It'll be lost in 30 seconds. And you hear people saying, I tell this kid every day, but you didn't teach it. Anybody can tell somebody something. That doesn't make you a teacher. 
teachers create environments and traps and things to make kids be successful. So the whole idea behind that poster was that we teach. What does it mean to be respectful? <coughs> what does that mean? You don't just say it. Be respectful, which is what PBIS people do. <coughs> you really should be teaching it. And then you say, well, let's say you're in the hallway. If you're really thinking about other people, which is being respectful, what would you be doing? Let's say you're in the hallway and somebody else is being really rude. What would a respectful person do? If somebody calls you a name, how do you handle that respectfully? Now, if you've taught it that way, now when a kid goes out into the hallway and they're thinking what to do, they know to go to the respect folder, which has a hallway component, which has a what if somebody's, you schemed it for them. That's called anchored instruction. It's that really that simple of a logic. And that's the reason for that poster. And that's the reason why we say, don't make a list of everything you want kids to do in your classroom and hang it on the wall. First, nobody's going to read it. And even if they did, nobody's going to remember it. You need to teach these as concepts. And you need to engage your kids and model and practice. I don't think anybody does any of that in PBIS schools. I think they make up a poster at the start of the year, hang it up, and that's that. In which case, it's really just kind of worthless. But that was the logic behind effective instruction with behavior right from the get-go. So these things really need to be I keep losing my notebook, really need to be brief. Three to five rules is what you should have in any location. Everything else is an example. What would you do? Well, what's the example we've talked about? What's another way we could do that? It's teaching. But somehow, somewhere, forever, we've gotten into this rut of come up with a code of conduct print it, send it home, and all the kids will memorize it, which I can tell you, zero kids in the history of kids have ever read the Code of Conduct. It's a legal document, that's all it is. It's not instruction. So I'm going to do a little activity with you. Make sure that you stay awake. I'm going to teach you a new thing today. This new thing is really important. The class you're in right now is called Colorful Geometry. Now, what I could do is I could tell you right now, we're talking about OSH. Here's an example. Here's what OSH is. Why would you need to know that? Have you ever seen an OSH at your house? Why would you use OSH? I'm not going to do any of that. I'm going to throw it out there and just allow you to discover it on your own. Sometimes I've heard people say, if they discover it on their own, they'll remember it more. Just show me the data. What do we know? We know that when you tell them and make them successful, they're more likely to use it again. It's the success part. But the explicit part makes it more. Anyway, I'm getting off task. Here's Osh. It's a geometric shape of some particular characteristic or characteristics. I'm not telling you what it is, but I'm showing you. Is it possible that Osh is a green triangle? It's possible. Is it possible that Osh is any kind of a triangle as long as it's on blue. Yes. Is it possible that Osh is a blue rectangle and the rest of that stuff doesn't matter at all? Yeah. Tell you what let's do. I'm going to pretend like you're my first classroom I ever taught. You're my eight, 14 to 18 year old boys. Let's go on a field trip <laughs> and discover Osh out there out on the campus. So hey, look over on that tree. It's another Osh. What'd you just learn? <laughs> You probably are learning that I don't know if that triangle is important. And if it is, it doesn't have to be on something else. Otherwise, I really don't know. Let's keep on walking. Hey, over there by the electric fence. It's another rush. Go look, but don't touch that fence. What'd you learn? I don't think this example teaches you anything. Here's the problem. The real world has every example you need to do great instruction, but the real world doesn't select them like a teacher. And what the problem is, is if you only look at the same examples that happen naturally, they might not teach you what you want them to. If I said, I'm going to teach you what a dog is, and you've never seen a dog, and we're going to do it naturally in my neighborhood, and everybody in my neighborhood has a black lab, do you know what a dog is? Teachers 
drive the lesson by thinking. Being explicit doesn't just mean me saying it in your face. It means me getting the examples and putting them in there and interacting with them with you so that you get it. But I'm going to say we did what we were supposed to do. I gave you some instruction. Let's go back to the classroom and we'll practice as a group. Raise your hand if you think this one's off. His hand was up immediately. They got like four or five people. It is. Great job. How'd you know? It has all the same three shapes that the other one's had. That's not what I mean. Tell everybody here what makes it be Osh. Uh... <laughs> right, never mind. I thought you were this and you were just messing me up. <laughs> I really don't want to hear your voice again for the rest of the way. If we're trying to do something serious here, you're messing around. If in fact, next thing you'll be sitting out here. Okay. Ignore him. I apologize on his behalf. Let's do another one. Raise your hand if you think this one's Osh. And like every other group I've ever worked with, after I punish him, I'm like, I punish the whole group by being negative while wow, with one guy. The rest of you are like, I'd like to be engaged, but not with him. There's no fun. So I have to say this. It was Osh. Nice job, Brainx. Okay, I've done everything we can do. I've run you through examples. We've practiced. Here's my activity. Tell me what you think about my idea for an activity. Remember who you are. Eight adjudicated 14 to 18-year-old boys in a lockdown facility. Hey, at the back table, I laid out a bunch of colored paper and some big sharp daggery scissors. What I want you guys to do is go back there and make some wash. Now, if my kids don't have any idea what wash is, what could go wrong? Now, I'm not suggesting that poor instruction results in murder, <laughs> although it could. What I'm saying is, when kids don't get it, if, if the lesson didn't make them get it, why would they behave in the next part? Because the next part is just, I'm failing, I'm failing, I'm failing. Do more of it, but I'm failing, I'm failing. At what point you just go, I'll bet if I flip them off, I wouldn't have to do this anymore. And they're right. It's a setup. We have to do this differently. I'm going to do it differently this time. I'm still not going to tell you which would be best, but I just want to show you the power of teacher-driven examples. Start here. What do you know now that you never knew before? Triangles are irrelevant. What's your name? Natty. Natty? Mm -hmm. Triangles are irrelevant. Don't say anything. I'm just telling you. <laughs> Here's another one. Now, these didn't appear in nature out on the field. I had to go on the internet and get these and go plant them out there. Because I knew that if you didn't see the right examples, you weren't going to get it. Now, I would also, again, I want my words in this too. Did you notice that? Did you see this? Why do you think? I'm not doing that. We didn't show this. Now I'm going to show you a non-example. Good instruction should include a non-example, but you put it at the end and you make it as minimally different as possible. You change a million things, I don't know what was important. I'm changing one thing. Let's practice again. Oh man, yellow in the middle, we've never seen one like that. And the thing is blue. Raise your hand if you think you might think this is Osh. Natty. Uh oh. <laughs> I'm nervous too, believe me. You think it's Osh? Let's see. It is. How'd you know? Because of the red outline of the rectangle. Red rectangle is the exact right answer, Ned. You have a real knack for colorful geometry. Let's talk later about you getting into my AP colorful geometry class. <laughs> this little exchange was caused by effective instruction. See, this positiveness that we get to have, we all both feel good because the instructions set him up to make that happen. It won't every time. That's why we have to try hard and we have to get a lot of successes to make up for inevitable <laughs> failures. What about this one? Raise your hand if you think it is. I don't know if you don't think it is or if you're just not wanting to play along. But it's not. Very good. How long do I need to do this with you guys? I need to do this until, <laughs> until I believe that 
when I take a step back, you'll still be successful. And I'm going to think ahead. Where would kids in this class make an error? This is me knowing my kids. The next thing you're doing is going back to your project, that big project we've been working on for two months. You're going to need this information to finish it. And now I'm thinking ahead to your project. I'm thinking, oh, man, they're gonna, this is going to screw up with them. So I'm going to do this. Just think about this for a second, guys. Is my phone more or less a rectangle? I mean, it's got curves, but let's just say it. Yeah, it's more or less a rectangle. So think about this. Is it still a rectangle? Yeah, so even if it's spinning, as long as it's got those four right angles, it's a rectangle. So today, when you're in your project, would you think this is OSH or not OSH? What do you think? OSH or not OSH? OSH is exactly right. Raise your hand if you agree with that. Okay. Anybody disagree? So where are you going to see this today? in your project, and you'll know when you see it. So this is, I'm setting you up. So today, when you're in your project and you get that OSH, I'm gonna come over and act like it's amazing. Like, how did you figure that out? I'm gonna give you the credit back for it. Everything I do is to set you up to get that credit. Now, all of this is just a basic part of good instruction, but these are things, oh, that's, that's not the right way I wanna go. The engagement it's still super important. Again, OTRs. And what we're finding is if all you do is ask kids questions, which is what happens when we say to people, crank up the OTRs. They ask more questions. And if the kids don't know the answers, it's disengaging. It shuts it down really quick. So if you're going to ask questions as an engagement tool, ask super easy questions. They're only there to get something back and forth. So what color shirt did you wear yesterday? That's an engagement. Now, I would like my OTRs to be focused on the lesson, but sometimes they go off lesson just to keep it going. I want you interested. I want you thinking about this. So I had this high school classroom I was in a couple years ago, and there was an emergency certified physics teacher. And she was teaching the Doppler effect, which is as exciting as it sounds. She's drawing this wave on the board and just Yammer in, in a monotone, quiet voice about the Doppler effect. And I look out at the room, every kid is looking down, not taking notes, just bored to death. So we talked about how do you engage kids? There are three ways to engage a classroom. Good luck with two of them. One, only teach things that are super interesting to everybody. Two, be incredibly entertaining. Sing and dance. Don't let kids take their eyes off you. Or three, get them to engage back and forth with you. Now, I'd like to do all three at different times, but I can do number three every day. And that's what I want to do. So here's what we did. I said, get them to predict. She put her phone in a plastic bag, turned on a tone, and swung it over her head. And so long story short about Doppler effect. When something's moving, the sound waves get compressed and it makes the pitch go. So she spun that phone over her head. This one kid yells out, hey, teacher's got her phone in the bag. Oh. And I was like, that's the most engaged I've seen that kid in like a month. <laughs> that, I'm not suggesting that those kids were going, aha, the Doppler effect. <laughs> they were going, what's she doing? Why is that doing that? That's engagement. But it wasn't just her doing it, which was entertaining. It was her kept asking them, did you hear that? What did you hear? And they were talking back and forth, and this is what we wanted to see in the classroom. How do you get them to do that with you? How do you find ways? I think the bag around the head was just a trap to get them to maybe ask a question. That's what we're looking for, those simple traps that get it going. This is a study I'm going to talk about really fast. Years ago, I looked to see how many Title I schools there were elementary in the state of Kentucky that were also distinguished in reading. There are 12, or were 12. I wrote letters to all 12 principals and said, can we come look at you because you're awesome? And 11 said yes. I sent my army of coders out, and they sat in every classroom of every school and coded what the teachers were doing. I then matched a sample of 11 high-poverty Title I schools 
demographically similar with the lowest reading scores in the state. There were plenty to choose from. This is called hierarchical linear modeling. What it does is it allows you to say, we're looking at kids and what they do score-wise, but they're nested inside these teachers, which are nested inside these schools. One thing came out significant, OTR. It's extremely significant, 0 .001. Here's what it means. If you're a kid in a poverty school that reached the highest rankings from the state in reading, you average more than 260 extra chances to do or say something during class per week. 260 per week. There's the difference between high and low performing poverty schools. The ones that are high performing, go out and get the kids and bring them along. They don't just talk at, they go and get them. And we keep finding that thing over and over with these OTRs. I'm shifting gears really quickly to positive feedback. And I'm showing you this sign, which I found on the internet. It says, notice, thank you for noticing this new notice. You're noticing it has been noted and will be reported through the authorities. I don't know where this came from. I just found it on the internet. This is what I mean when I say positive reinforcement in schools. <laughs> Nobody is talking about candy or goodies or tokens or toys or we're talking about, wow, you did that right, good for you. I'm impressed, good for you, wow, thank you. Yes, correct, that's it. That's what we're looking at. I think that seems fairly straightforward and simple. It's probably the biggest battle I fight is people telling me that we shouldn't do this. It's bad for kids to say, thank you, good job, even though the evidence is just completely overwhelming. This is brand new data. I mean, this is from last week. Brand new data I have. These are just from, J this is just from JCPS. 59 schools, the dependent variable is the rate of suspensions. The rate of suspensions in JCPS schools is significantly negatively correlated with the number of positive things teachers say in the school. I can go into a school and count the number of times teachers and adults say, thank you, good, yes, right, et cetera, the kids, and from that, predict what their suspension rate will be. It's, it's an important concept. This one also brand spanking new, none of it published or anything yet. Also JCPS. These are schools that are proportional in how to suspend kids. Kids, black and white, do not act differently. I've got 13,000 observations, and I can tell you, rates of problem behavior are the same across races. It's done. We know it. But in schools that are proportional, those kids, black and white, get the same rate of negative statements from teachers. In schools that are disproportional, behaviors are exactly the same. Black kids are 55% more likely to hear something negative. And it doesn't matter what the race of the teacher is. We see the same thing. We're back to our implicit bias issue. I don't believe, maybe I'm naive, I don't believe that these people are out there going, I hate black kids. But they also aren't thinking. And is my behavior different? And that's part of what we have to get people thinking about, is it is different in a lot of these schools. When we talk about acknowledging behavior, I think we should talk about three levels. Level one, use your words. That simple. Level two, I call this privileges, but it's not what you think. These already exist. So I was thinking about this kid I was watching. <laughs> I was supposed to be doing a consult because he's got behavior problems. He's having a great morning. Everything's going great. They get up and go to the computer lab and a big argument breaks out over who gets which of the identical computers. And I'm thinking, there's an opportunity for a second layer of acknowledgement. You know, you had a great morning. Why don't you take first pick on the computer? Somebody was gonna get first pick. All you're doing is using another opportunity to acknowledge a kid. 
again, they didn't get a computer and nobody else did. They just got to be the first one. I have this high school that I was working with in Utah, and they said, we acknowledge kids in the hallway and say, you did a great job. You can sit at the special table at lunch. And again, I have nothing to do with this. This is what they came up with. And I said, what's the special table? And they said, we call it the special table. I said, what do you get there? <laughs> nothing. I'm like, seriously, high school kids? And they're like, yeah, everybody wants to be acknowledged. That's all it is. Level three, public acknowledgement. Now, my tough guy kids don't want to have the hero picture on the wall, but they'll take a certificate home says we recognize you i had lots of kids when i were you do the wall of fame and they got to sign it or the extra effort club you got to sign a wall they'll do that kind of stuff it's free all we're doing is saying we're recognizing you again acknowledgement is all we need i honestly believe and the data would support this that if all you did in every school was cranked up the number of times adults recognize kids doing the right thing you'd get giant effects, and you wouldn't need all the other tangibles that are handed out. Why do you think people hand out the tangibles? It's easier than to remember to say things. It really is. You give those things to adults, and they don't, still don't say anything. You just go down the hall through all these things to kids. It's, it's really worthless. But that's what people do because it's a lot harder to remember to do it. The final point I want to make with this is that we don't have any, zero, we don't have any evidence that removing a kid from a classroom or school is a good idea. Now, let me say this. My entire career, I've worked with kids in lockdown or self-contained DVD room, et cetera, and I fully admit and understand there are times when kids need to be removed from a classroom, and there are times when kids need to be suspended. However, if the reason we're removing them is to teach them a lesson, bad idea. Because the best conditional probability you can get from a kid who's been removed is that they'll be removed again. If you're removing them so that you won't have to remove them in the future, it's actually a bad bet. It'll happen more. So we have to have better strategies. And I'm going to jump here a little bit because I want to show you a couple things before I finish. In terms of the environment, I mentioned consistency. This is the schedule I used to, not D, but I used to put a schedule like this on the board. So remember, I've got those eight adjudicated kids. If they think I'm making it up, it's ripe for a negotiation. So I go, hey, it's 9.30, let me think. Let's do math. They're thinking like, he just made that up. We're not doing it. Get him. And they're like, okay, we're not doing that today. We're going to do this. Here's what I figured out. You write it on the board, you do it the exact same way every day. And I go, hey, 9.30, time for math. And oh, yeah, I know, I don't want to either, but it's 9.40, what can you do? <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I'd like to not, but the schedule says we have to. And I was, those big, tough kids are going, damn the schedule, and they're getting out their books. I was like, you can't argue with the schedule. It's consistency, but it allowed me to also say, we're going to finish this early because you guys got on it so fast. Give it back to them for what they did. Have an expectation. Expectations aren't bad things. When I was in elementary school, I remember my teacher saying, and when you finish with that, you can do this or this. That's an expectation. It's delivered as a choice. But if I say to my kids that I always taught, when you're done with that, find something to do. They will, and I'll be sorry. Remember what we're doing is set kids up to be successful. And the more they have a tendency to have those issues, the more they need you to tell them, here's explicitly what you can do to be successful. And when they do it, you go over there and say, wow, what a great choice you made. Well, they really have a choice. You told them to do that, but I'm giving them the credit for it every time. I'm going to talk quickly about positions and desks, and then I'll finish. And I realized, and I'm sorry for this, but I approach this with a much higher level of paranoia than I know you do because of where I've always worked. But I can't walk through a room in a straight line because of where I've worked. If he's thinking about doing something wrong, when I get right here, he's thinking, okay, go for it. Because I'm walking a straight line. 
And this is just something that being a glorified prison guard does to you. <laughs> is that I walk through rooms like this now. I just go, man, hey, how are you guys? What's up? How are you guys doing? <laughs> this is the rule, the way I think of it. It's called the one second rule. I want every kid in this room to believe that I could see their eyeballs in less than one second if I wanted to. Now, I'm not looking at you right now, three and four and five seconds, but I could in less than a second. Now, the whole time I've been talking, Natty has been thinking real hard about slugging him in the back of the head. The whole hour I've been talking, that's all he could, that's why he kept getting Oshron, because he was thinking about slugging him. <laughs> but he hasn't. And that allows me to do this. Hey, man, you know how we've been talking about hands to self? You have been nailing it. Man, you are, I am so impressed with what an effort you're making. Remind me to tell your mom. Now, those of you who know Natty right now are saying, come on, the only reason he didn't slug him is because you've been looking at him. Thank you. That's called effective teaching. I created a trap for that kid, and I'm giving him the credit. How many days in a row or months in a row do I need to do this before he starts thinking, I did a pretty good job with this. It's called behavioral momentum. If you go on a diet for one day, it's easy to break it. If you can stick with it for a week or two, you don't want to break it. Exercise, same thing. Making kids successful, same thing. It's not foolproof, it's a probability. Behavioral momentum is what we're looking for. Now, by that same token, I have to think about what will not work. So if I say, you guys keep working. I got to go into the hallway here where I've got a filing cabinet for some reason. <laughs> What's Natty thinking when I head out the door? This is a once in a lifetime. <laughs> There's no way I can pass this opportunity up. It can never come again. And he slugs in. And I come back in. And now we're dealing with problem behavior. It's not my fault, but there were some things that I could have taken responsibility for to prevent that. Think ahead of time what I might need before I come in. If I forget, I'd have probably done this. I gotta get some real heavy piece of paper out of my filing cabinet. I'm gonna need a hand. How about Daddy? I'm picking him because I don't want to leave him alone, but I'm not gonna say that. By that same token, I assign seats that way. Look at the board up here. Find the one with your name on it. This, I lied to kids right here. This is completely random. Just mixing it up so you sit next to different people. Now they're sitting in a place where I know I have a higher chance of being able to say, good for you. But if I find out this was a bad idea right here, I didn't know this one, what I will do is I won't move them during class unless it's absolutely necessary. I will use my proximity. I will spend a lot of my class walking right here so I can keep saying, and you'll leave that, right? You guys have that good job, guys. I'm just going to use proximity. Tomorrow when they come in, I'm going to go, last night I thought, what the heck, let's mix it up. And I flipped a bunch of coins and I mixed it up, so find the one with your name on it. And the kids go, that's weird. The only thing different is Natty's sitting over there. Like, yeah, I don't know. It's <laughs> uh, and a lot of times, I'll even find a kid that never has problems. <laughs> and move her just so that kids are thinking, yeah, he does just randomly move kids. <laughs> I have a room arrangement, and what I do to not be about your bad behavior. I want to be able to focus on the success. And as I was saying earlier, every single thing that I'm doing, with instruction, with management, with everything, is just a glorified trick for me to have a better chance to say, good job to you. That's it. Whether we're teaching math or reading or behavior, it's me trying to find a way to say, I'll bet you can't wait to do this again tomorrow because you're so good at it. That's the message I want to use. So I'm just going to fly through this to end. Um, rooms. I want to be able to move through a room. There is no research that says one room arrangement is better than another, but I would like to walk through this room and engage with all of you as much as I can. This is really hard for me to walk through something that's closed in like this. This room, I like I said, is a horrible room for instructor. Now, it's not made for someone to walk around. It's made for you to look up here. But notice that if I'm walking around a room and want to be able to put my hand on every desk or talk to every kid, look how many steps I've got to take. 
plus, where should I put my kids that I think need me more? Two mistakes people make. Those kids that have a lot of problems, they need to be as far away from everybody as possible. Can we put them out in the hall? Is it possible to put them in the closet? The idea is they need more of you, not less. But the other mistake people make is, let's have a special grouping of the problem kids, which is also a bad idea. Instead, I put them within a direct footpath of me so that no matter what I'm doing, and I'm front, if I want to keep on teaching, I don't have to. I see a problem going on there, I'm just going to keep on talking, and I'm going to say, so you're going to need a pencil, right? And you're going to need, and then I'm just going to stop, and then I can say, what can I do for you? What can you need? But I want them where I'm going to get to them frequently more easily. My most hated, which I've changed to this, which gives me fewer steps. I'm not saying you should use rows. I like rows, but you have to consider what's going on. Fewer steps, and I'm still going to put kids in places around the room, but where I have direct access. The fours. I just circle them a little bit, and now I can create a circle, and I can walk in the room, and I put my kids that I think need me most on the inside of that circle. I can still walk around to the back of any of those groupings, but if I'm just teaching and talking and moving fast, I'm moving around, right around kids where I can give them reminders and say, great more traps to set them up to be successful. And my favorite, which I hardly ever get to teach in, I like this one because I don't move a circle. I randomly move. Because it doesn't matter where I am. I'm always about three steps away from a table. But I do think about where do I put the kids that are needy. This is the last slide I'm going to show you. When you decide that you do have to do something about kids that are having problems, do not yell across the room to kids. So I come walking through here and things are great. Good job, guys. I've walked by these guys and everything's great and I'm walking back. And now I hear problems going on over there. If I go up front, everybody here is like, cool, what's going on up front? Everybody who was on task, I just drug you off task. Here's what you do when you notice kids off task at all. You start with eye contact. I refer to this as the mom look. I, my mom is still alive, and I think you still make me stop in my tracks with one of these. <laughs> Four seconds is how long you give the mom look. Usually, kids will notice the mom look, and they'll get back to work. Now they're looking right at you, and so you can say something quiet. You go like this, good choice. I'll be right there. Always say, I'll be right there, even if you're not. <laughs> oh, good choice, guys. I'll be right there. Make a circle and find your way back to them, but it doesn't need to be immediate. If they don't respond to the mom look, you do the mom look again with proximity, but you hope on the way there to give them a hint. This is the best work I've seen in a long time. So impressed with this group. Wow, this is going great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping they heard this and they're like, we want him to say we're doing great, so they start working. If they don't, then I stop here and do another four seconds. <laughs> Usually this is where you get a gulp. And they get back to work. And here's what you say when they get back to work. What a great choice you guys have made. I see you're getting going on this. Keep, I want to say something, but just a second. I'll be right back. When I leave, here's what I'm thinking. How many seconds could I be gone and still be able to come back and go, wow, great job? So I'm thinking about these two, and I'm thinking, five seconds. Yeah. So you guys keep going. I'll be right back. Again, really impressed, guys. Such maturity in this room today, getting this stuff done. You guys are the, some of the smartest people I've seen. You guys are still working? I am so impressed. You keep that going. I'm going for 10 seconds this time. And I just keep branching that out. Again, it's, it's a trap. I'm setting you up so you really don't have a chance to go off task again before I tell you, you're on task again. I just try to keep that going. <laughs> now, when you've got your entire class filled with these kinds of kids, clearly it's more challenging. You've got to group right, and you've got to move right to make that work. If they don't ever get back on, this is the last point I'm going to make to you, always 
confront kids with a question. It's less likely to get blowback. Get busy to a behavior disordered kid is like saying, I challenge you. You do it or else. That's what they hear. So I don't know if you're behavior disordered or not. I'm not going to take chances. I'm going to raise my probability of getting compliance by starting with a question. When I do a first question with kids, I put it back on me. I'm an adult. I don't need, I don't care if they think I did something wrong. I'll do this. Hey guys, I'm concerned that maybe I didn't explain this very well. I explained it fast and I'm not sure you guys both got that first part. So I'd like to tell you again, just because I feel bad. So the first part you do this, did you guys know that part? Yeah, okay. So maybe I didn't do it as bad as I thought. Tell you what, <laughs> you guys get working on that first part and, and I'll be right back to see how it's going because I'm concerned that I didn't do that. I'm putting that all on myself. I don't care. I don't need, I don't have this ego thing that it's me or them. Put it on me. Now, if I go back again, I'm probably going to be a little more stern. But here's what you don't want to do. You don't want to give a big blank yellow thing because it's going to come back on you. And don't turn your question, and this is what we adults do, don't turn your question into sarcasm. Go back there again. What's, hey, here's a question. Why aren't you guys doing what everybody else is doing? <laughs> That's not really a question. That's sarcasm. And when you use sarcasm, you really raise the probability of somebody doing something worse back to you. I always like to think, when I worked in residential treatment, I was 22 years old when I started there, and some of those kids are 18. They weren't that much younger than me. And you'd make a simple comment to them, and they'd say the dumbest smart-ass remark, and I would think, oh, man, I've got the best smart-ass comeback to that. <laughs> and all that does is set that kid up to say something even worse back to you. It always was a losing proposition. But because of my upbringing or because I'm a male or something, I have to work really hard at not doing the sarcasm thing. It always makes kids be the loser in that eye, and then they want to go back at you in some way. Again, you have to check your ego and just come back to, my job is to make you successful. Whatever it is I'm going to have to do to do that, I'm okay with it. I, I don't need to feel like I'm in charge. I need to feel like kids are being successful. And that's kind of the way you have to couch it in your brain to do that. So, I have a bunch of stuff on my website. The Center for Instructional Behavior Research in Schools. It's fairly new and I'm building it all the time and there's a bunch of videos and things on there. and. Um, it's all free. So if you're interested in other parts, some of the kinds of things I'm talking about, you could look there. Uh, we try to post our research as we're doing it up there. Are there any questions about, I know I covered a zillion things in an hour and 15 minutes, but <laughs> any questions about any of the things I talked about? Did you look at that PDF I had up there? Is it correct or what we've seen? It's, it has all the slides plus some that I didn't use. All right. Thank you, guys. There's one year veteran. I can tell you, I work with bad kids. He works well. I like bad kids. I like tough kids. Uh, or that thing that man just told you is dead on true. You ever have a kid throw you over a table? Um, who grabbed me and rustled me onto a table. I had a kid throw a chair at me, had a kid spit on me, bite me, swing a golf club at me. Yep. And those are the good days. <laughs> Last thoughts. We didn't get to the assignment, did we? All right. Monday, you'll get the directions. You have until when? I don't want to see regurgitation. I want to see things. I will send you how to use the uh, picture graphics and picture chart. You play, you experiment. As I've said to you, I will give you the username and password that allow you to get in as the administrator. You want to use it with the kids? Please do. Oh, by the way, you know one of the best things you can do to see what Terry's talking about is true, especially about room arrangement? Go down and look at the computer lab in your high school or your middle school. They didn't set up like this worthless room is set up. Just ask the, the teacher, so how are things going in here? You're not going to be going very good in that kind of a room. 
when we designed the computer labs back in the day, we wanted them to all be around the classrooms with swivel chairs. So you can turn kids around so you can see. Final, I don't know who you are yet. I hope you're getting a sense of who I am. So I'm going to go over here and stand by the door. Your job for this evening, the only job you got to do this evening, when you walk out this door, shake my hand, tell me your name, please. Can you do that? <laughs> I may be legally blind, but God, when he took away my eyeballs, gave me one thing, and that is a memory. So now that I have looked Phil dead in the eyes and he shook my hand, I'm going to know who Phil is. Now, Phil, the way I work is I have a filing cabinet. One of the drawers of my filing cabinet is going to be called 679. What will have to happen is when I meet you again, not here, but out there, I'll go, open the drawer, open the drawer, Phil. I got you. Thank you, Phil. Get out of here. Go home. Have a good Friday. My God, you should have a good Friday. Remember what this man's coach Don't get by me without saying who you are. Hi, Jack. Is it okay to call you? All right. We'll talk. Hey, great food.
They're not the, 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 the don't fit into anything nicely. But you are. It's in there. I'm Christian. I'm Christian. Yeah. When I got to your all's group, I was like, what would these people do? And the first thing that flitted in my brain was ESL. I made the art. Yeah, I did you know. social studies and math at the art. You're all at ESL. Yeah. Yeah. Love those guys. So what are you finding? Are you mostly one or the other? Mostly Somalian, mostly Cuban, mostly, or is it all mixed up? Oh, I've got you know, like 20, 25 kids, and they're all from everywhere. Except for one class, for some reason, I ended up with almost every kid from Africa. Two Hispanic kids that just got out of the league. Uh, they don't know what to do. So. <laughs> we have a bigger deal. So. No, and, and I looked at the studies, so I lots of reinforcements. Most of the time, they don't understand what you're saying. And that's true. And they don't want to be patted on the head. You got to be careful about it. Exactly. Exactly. Have you had a class with Arlene McGrath here? She's the ASL in the district. She gets it. Yeah, she's one of my heroes. So, if yeah. you ever hear that name right. floating around the building, because she's yeah, the house in Shawnee. You're not Shawnee anymore, right? No, we are at uh, the old Myers Middle School. Uh, another weird. We've had. Uh, Why we didn't do this over the summer, I don't know. But, but kids are fascinated by the giant spools of water. And <laughs> like, can we touch it? No. no. <laughs> but yeah, you're going to touch it. <laughs> Sometimes I'll tell you the story about I was a teacher, right? When I got hired in to be the special ed guru for technology teacher. About a month after that, they came to us and said, We need volunteers to go to Microsoft. I'll go to Microsoft. So I go to Microsoft School, I get Microsoft System Engineer certified. I come back. Well, now we want you to go out and wire buildings. Because nobody knew how to wire buildings in Louisville, Kentucky. Now, and this is a long time ago. So, yeah, I've been there. I've been in schools. All through the ceilings. <laughs> and you were? Lisbon. And you are? Colin no, I haven't had it. Well, I did a long time ago. I have long offered public uh, But No, I cut my hair short probably when I took the A to Z program of the year. Because I took the online class. So she's trying to get out to get all of their credits so that they can get a certificate. For some reason, I have so, yeah, and I have a lot of things to do. One thing you'll have in common is six classes on the 15th. And I hate this idea. I've got this class. People start out, they want to say, what do you want me to do? So, do I have to do module one? No. You want to do module seven, come back to one, four, five. Now, the people over in Delphi would say, well, it's horrible. It should be a progression. No, it shouldn't be. It should be a separate idea that the end where I'm going to ask you stay here until I leave this briefing or who I'm going to end up working my way out. I'm thinking about just getting something to do. So, I think that's where I'm going to go. Oh, I'm a difficult place, but I'm happy where I am. So, um, and I think I'm eventually going to go for um, administration and all that. So I'm just going to learn and learn and learn. Work the way of life. Yeah. I mean, that's how it is. I mean, I think.